Vienna. Professor Sun Kong teaches Vietnamese classical music at the conservatory in Paris. And Mr. Hong is his student. The last song was a song from the south of Vietnam, and the other two were songs from the middle of Vietnam. Do you recognize the songs? Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of John Adams, he's to welcome this evening with the American author Robert Owen Butler, who is our guest in the literary series American Literature Today. Welcome to Amsterdam, Mr. and Mrs. Butler. Um, please accept our congratulations for your recent marriage. And this trip to Amsterdam is their honeymoon, by the way. <laughs> Butler, and very glad, of course, to have me here. But it's also perfect timing because, of course, everybody has seen the news. Um, Ho Chi Minh City celebrates the 20 years of freedom, is of course seen from the Vietnamese point of view. And it seems very appropriate and, and a very good timing to have Mr. Butler now, but this time here in Amsterdam, because Mr. Butler has written lots of things on Vietnam. But I mean, that's not something you can be proud of. But they're very good. They're very good things. They're very sensible things. And what I like about it, mostly, is that it's not only from the viewpoint of the Americans who came there, but indeed it's about the encounter of two cultures, the American uh, culture and the Vietnamese culture. And especially, I think, that has been so in the book that Mr. Bach is going to read from tonight, Good Sand from Strange Mountain. It's well known, it's, it's won the Pulitzer Prize in 1993, and it's a marvelous book. I mean, this is a cliche, but sometimes you have to use cliches. It's a marvelous book because it portrays Vietnamese people, migrants who moved to the United States, who live in Louisiana, and what Mr. Butler has done is he has given voice to the people who live there. And, and the strangest thing is, for me at least, as an outsider, as, as a Dutchman, that within this, this complex, this complexity of things that have happened, there is no hatred, no bitterness in the voices. And perhaps, as, as Europeans or Dutchmen or whatever, it's something to remember that for example, the, the, the first story of A Good Scent is about an old man. And the man says his first phrase, I don't have no hatred in me. That's something, um, especially if we think and realize that the relationship between Germany and Holland <coughs> in 50 years still is somewhat of a ritualistic sort of animosity. Um, for me, it's fascinating. Perhaps we have some time to discuss uh, that. A Good Scent from a Strange Mountain is perhaps the most well-known novel or volume of short stories that Mr. Bell has written. Um, I remember a phrase from the New York Times where he was, it was said that it was a wonderful book and of course it was all right that it was Mr. Butler. But then there was a sort of sneer where it said, 
Um, but who the hell is Robert Odom Butler? Well, they know that by now, I guess. <laughs> um, there are more novels, by the name novel circle. Hell Age of Eden, um, 12 times, yeah. For me, it's, it's very interesting. 12 times Mr. Butler has tried to publish Hell Age of Eden, and 12 times it was rejected. So there is some hope for starting writers here. <laughs> um, on this <coughs> ground, the Jews, the other novels also, and the latest novel is They Whisper, Flash the Thing in the Night Ones. Uh, Mr. Butler was born in St. Louis, Clubhouse in St. Louis, in Granite City, a steel town. And when I read about that, I could imagine coming from Granite City how sensual Vietnam and how elegant Vietnam must have been, amongst other things. Um, we had dinner tonight, uh, last night, with also with his wife, Betsy. And we discussed the fact that he had been here in 1967, which is the so-called magic year where everything was here in Amsterdam. The strange thing, though, was that Mr. Butler didn't smoke. No pot. Uh, that, that, is, that is exceptional, I guess. And he sort of described himself as from the pre-hippie generation. Perhaps that can explain that he didn't go to Canada after his studies. But indeed, he went to the war. He went to Vietnam, be it as a translator. He um, got his language studies in Washington, D.C., <coughs> a, a very intense course in Vietnamese language. And when he says, Mr. Butler says, I made it a central point of my life to become deeply engaged with the Vietnamese, I think he's right, and I think he had the ability to do so, because indeed he could speak the language. If you just imagine that most of the Vietnamese were, were shocked, <coughs> I guess, when an American soldier could, see, could say, good morning, in Vietnamese, then indeed it must have been something where a real conversation was possible and where one could not only translate, but indeed have conversations, have, have the, the exchange of thoughts. Um, so it's a cliche to say that Vietnam, Vietnam influenced him, but sometimes indeed cliches are true, and in this, in this instance they are, they are. You can just read it in, in the books. Um, the latest novel, They Whisper, Flourishly, is, as uh, Mr. Butler says, about somebody who introduced himself, Ira Honig Wade, that's the protagonist of the, of the novel, as a gloriously heterosexual. I think that's, that's a very nice phrase, a glorious heterosexual. Um, there has been some rumors, or I, I heard from somebody, that this book, The Whisper, should, was a macho book. It was a book about machismo. It was like, Norman Mailer, Hemingway, and I thought it was, but you have to read it because it, it isn't. It really isn't, and it's very interesting, and you know the old, the old question of, of Coit, <laughs> what really does why? Um, and I think Mr. Butler wants to know, was ist das why? He really is trying to, to understand, or at least Ira Holloway is, he's trying to understand what a woman is, what the feminine body is, and of course it has to do with sex. Lots of sex, lots of sex. <laughs> but in a very, how can you say that? In a very clinic way. I mean, it, it's not sentimental. Of course it's emotional, but it's not sentimental. So there, there is a difference between that. Um, Anna mentioned it already. Um, there is a marriage here. They married in Central Park. And I wouldn't mention that, well, I would always mention that, because it's very interesting. But um, I was impressed by the books that Mr. Butler has written. But I have to admit, I was most impressed by the fact that coming Sunday, when they are going to fly back to New York, in the New York Times, there will be photographs of the marriage of the new couple. <laughs> so, I can conclude here and say, please buy books of Mr. <laughs> Butler, <laughs> but also get that copy of the New York Times. Mr. Butler, please go.
I'm delighted at this crowd. The, the more I talk to Anne, uh, the more I expected tonight uh, two chickens and a horse head. <laughs> 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 I'm told that's the best phrase. Maybe we'll use something in the translation. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see how a wonderful a crowd that there is here. Uh, such a busy week for all. Um, to speak, uh, and we'll speak more about Vietnam and about writing. Uh, Stefan and I have a kind of uh, dialogue here, and I'll take questions from you folks too uh, after the break. But I do want to say a few things before uh, I speak in the way that all artists, I think, are most comfortable in speaking. And, and perhaps this is the main thing that I want to stress initially here. My encounter with Vietnam was uh, as intensely as an individual encountering intensely individual people. And this is the way I think that my work has been different from the work of others. I was given the gift of language there by a very unlikely source, the US Army. I, was, I did not go to Vietnam happily or willingly. Um, I chose not to exile myself when I was gobbled up in the, the draft uh, in the early 1969. It was a terrifying time to be bound for Vietnam. But I did end up in language school and learn the language, um, spent a year there the Vietnamese speaker. And then I ended up in Vietnam, worked five months out in the countryside, and then ended up for seven months working in a civilian clothes job, living in an old French hotel in Saigon. And I worked as a linguist and administrative assistant to an American foreign service officer who was the advisor to the mayor of Saigon. And my greatest pleasure in life one of the greatest pleasures I've ever had in my life was being able, almost every night of the week, to wander out into the steamy back alleys of Saigon, and where the Vietnamese never seemed to sleep. And I would crouch in the doorways with these people. <coughs> and the Vietnamese, as a group, I feel, are the warmest, most generous-spirited people in the world. And invariably, they invited me into their homes, and into their culture, and into their lives. And my experience of that place was in those little back alley rooms with the ancestor shrine nearby, and the incense still smoking there, and sharing the uh, the pho, the moon ba sao. Crouching there on the straw mats with these people and entering into their lives one by one. And it seems to me, I, I get very uncomfortable speaking about, because I'm often asked to render political judgments or sociological judgments or anthropological judgments about, about all of that. But it seems to me that artists exist in the world in order to provide a, another way of looking at human experience than that. The artist encounters that chaos out there that is life on the planet Earth. As much in the streets of New York City and Central Park or on the streets of Amsterdam as in the streets of Saigon in the midst of a war. Whatever the social veneer, whatever the political circumstances, we are all terribly fragile on this planet. And we all carry around inside us the terrible fear that in spite of circus appearances, we are each of us utterly alone. And it is the artist's mission to, as other people do, artists look at that chaos and sense some vision of order behind it. But the artist is very uncomfortable 
in expressing that order in the ways that other people who seek order behind the chaos do. Scientists and politicians and theologians and philosophers and so on. These people see the chaos and then sense some kind of order and they're very comfortable in describing that vision of order in abstractions and in ideas and in generalizations. scientific principles and psychoanalytical insight and theological dogma or philosophical thought. <clears throat> they translate the experience of life into those generalized forms. But the artist is conscious first and foremost of the fact that we all encounter the chaos directly through our senses. And I had a lovely conversation yesterday with a recorder from the Telegraph. He translated, I think it lost something, unless I'm misunderstanding the word in Dutch, translated it of me into being a romantic. It's not what I said. I said I'm a sensualist. That artists are not intellectuals. They are sensuals. We are focused entirely on the encounter that we each of us have one by one through our bodies, through our senses, with the world. And when we see a vision of order behind this chaos, we, are, we can feel comfortable in expressing that vision only by going back to the chaos and pulling out bits and pieces of those moment-to-moment -moment sensual impressions and reshaping those moments and giving them back to others as if they were experienced themselves, that you encounter the text through your senses in exactly the way that we have encountered life. And the vision the coherence of what might be called thought in an artist's work comes not from the ability to translate it into something rational and abstract, but rather as a kind of harmonic that's set up inside us, a resonance. You thrum to a work of art. You do not understand it. You thrum. You know the word? It's like the strings on their instruments here. We vibrate at a certain tonality to that vision. Instead of trying to turn it into something abstract, which distances us, really. And that's the essence of art. And that's what Vietnam gave me. Stefan was right. I did have, however. I grew up in a steel mill town, and I worked in the steel mills, and I drove a taxi cab in that town, and it too was a sensual experience, and I'm drawing on that in my work. But when you learn a foreign language properly, as you all know, as you are essentially bilingual in this country, at least, you know what it is. You don't just learn the equivalencies of words, you rename the world. And in renaming the world into Vietnamese and in going to that beautiful country, with the intensity of that experience in a situation where there were no front lines and that you were conscious of your vulnerability at all moments. And every morning you woke up and those cosmic questions were always before you because you were conscious of the fragility of life. In that context, Vietnam was ravishingly sensual. It energized that part of me that thought like and felt like about the world as the artist does. So for me, the encounter with Vietnam was the encounter with the part of myself that could produce these kinds of words. So, if that's all true, then I'm most comfortable speaking in these terms. And let me read one of these stories to you. A lot of choices, but I'm going to read a story in the voice of a woman, a story called Fairy Tale. <clears throat> I 
I like the way fairy tales start in America. When I learn English for real, I buy books for children, and I read Once Upon a Time. I recognize this word, upon, from some GI who buys me Saigon teas and spends some time with me, and he is a cowboy from the great state of Texas. He tells me he gets up on the back of a bull, and he rides it. I tell him he is joking with Mr. Noy. That's my Vietnam name. But he says, no, he really gets up on a bull. I make him explain that up on, so I know I'm hearing right. I want to know for truth so I can tell the story to all my friends so that they understand. No lie, what this man who stays with me can do. After that, a few years later, I come to America and I read some fairy tales to help me learn more English. And I see this word and I ask the man in the place I work on Bourbon Street in New Orleans if this is the same, up on and upon. He is a nice man who comes late in the evening to clean up after the men who see the show. He says this is a good question, and he thinks about it, and he says that yes, they are the same. I think this is very nice. How you get up on the back of time and ride, and you don't know where it will go, or how it will try to throw you off. Once upon a time, I was a dumb Saigon barber. If you want to know how dumb some Vietnam bar girl can be, I can give you one example. A man brought me to America in 1974. He says he loves me, and I say I love that man. When I meet him in Saigon, he works in the embassy of America. He can bring me to this country even before he marries me. But see, he says he wants to marry me, and maybe I think that this idea scares me a little bit. But I say, what the hell? I love him. Then boom, I'm in America. And this man is different from in Vietnam. And I guess he thinks I am different too. How dumb is a Saigon bar girl is this? I hear him talk to a big crowd of important people in Vietnam. Businessmen, politicians, big people like that. I am there too. And I wear my best aoyai, red like an apple. And my guan, my silk trousers are white. He speaks in English to these Vietnam people because they are big, so they know English. Also, my boyfriend does not speak Vietnam. But at the end of his speech, he says something in my language. And it is very important to me. You must understand one thing about the Vietnam language. We use tones to make our words. The sound you say is important, but just as important is what your voice does. If it goes up or down or stays the same or it curls around or it comes from your throat very tight. These all change the meaning of the word, sometimes very much. And if you say one tone and I hear a certain word, there is no reason for me to think that you mean some other tone, some other word. It is not until everything is uh, too late and I am in America that I realize something is wrong in what I'm hearing that day. Even after this man is gone and I am in New Orleans, I have to sit down and try all different tones to know what he wanted to say to those people in Saigon. He wanted to say in my language, may Vietnam live for 10,000 years. What he said, very clear, was the sunburnt duck is lying down. Now, if I think this man says that Vietnam should live for 10,000 years, I think he is a certain kind of man. But when he says that a sunburnt duck is lying down, boom, my heart melts. We have many tales in Vietnam, some about ducks. I never hear this tale that he's talking about, but it sounds like it's very good. I should ask him that night what this tale is. But we make love, and we talk about me going to America, and I think I understand anyway. The duck is not burned up, destroyed. He's only sunburned. Vietnam women don't like the sun. It makes their skin dark like the peasants. I understand. And the duck is not crushed on the ground. He's just lying down, and he can get up when he wants to. I love that man for telling the Vietnam people this true thing. So I come to America. And when I come here, I do not know that I will be in more bars. I come thinking I still love that man. And I will be a housewife with a toaster machine and a vacuum cleaner. 
Then when I think I don't love him anymore, I try one last time, and I ask him in the dark night to tell me about the sunburnt duck. What is that story? He thinks I am one crazy Vietnam girl, and he says things that can burn Miss Noy more than the sun. So boom, I'm gone from that man. There is no more South Vietnam, and he gives me all the right papers so I can be American, and he can look like a good man. This is all happening in Atlanta. Then I hear about New Orleans. I am a Catholic girl, and I am a bar girl. And this city sounds to me like I can be both those things. I am 25 years old, and my titties are small, especially in America, but I am still number one girl. I can shake it for you. And soon, I am a dancer in a bar on Bourbon Street. And everybody likes me to stay a Vietnam girl. Maybe some men have nice memories of Vietnam girls. I have nice memories. In Saigon, I work in a bar they call Blossoms. I have one Blossom. Around the corner, I have a little apartment. You have to walk into the alley, and then you go up the stairs three floors. And I have a place there where all the shouting and the crying and sometimes the gunfire in the street sounds very far away. I do not mix with the other girls. They do bad things. They take drugs, steal from the men. One girl lives next to me in Saigon and she does bad things. Soon people begin to come in a black car. She goes. She likes it, but I do not talk with her. One day she goes to the black car and does not come back. She leaves everything in her place, even her shrine to her parents. Very bad. I live alone in Saigon. I have a double sheet double bed with a very nice sheet, two pillows, a seated closet with my clothes, which are very nice, three owie eyes, one apple red, one blue, like you see in the eyes of some American man, one black, like my hair. I have a glass cabinet with pictures. My father, some two or three Americans <coughs> who like me very special. My mother, my son, Yes, I have a son. One American man gives me that son, but my boy is living in Vietnam with my mother. My mother says I cannot bring up a child with my life. I say to her that my son should have the best. If Miss Noy is not the best for my son, then my son should be someplace different. When the man brings me to America, he does not want a son either. And my mother does not talk to me very much anyway, except to say that my my son is Vietnam boy, not American boy. At least my mother is my blood. But sometimes she is unhappy about that, I think. I do not think they are happy in Vietnam. But who can say? You have a mother, and then you have a son, and then boom, you do not have either a mother or a son. Though they are alive somewhere, so I do not have to pray for their souls. I do not have to be unhappy. I pray in my little room in Saigon. I am a Catholic girl, and I have a large statue of Mary in my room. That statue is Mary, the mother of God, not <coughs> Mary Magdalene, who was a bar girl one time, too. My statue of Mary, the mother of God, is very beautiful. She is wearing a blue robe, and her bare feet are sticking out at the bottom. Her feet are beautiful, like the feet of a Vietnam girl. And I pray to Mary and I paint her toenails, and I talk to her. She faces the door and does not see my bed. I sleep with men in Saigon. This is true. But I sleep with only one at a time. I do not take drugs with any man. I do not steal from any man. I give some man love when he is alone and frightened and he wants something soft to be close to him. I, I take money for this loving, but I do not ask them to take me to restaurants or to movie shows, or to buy me jewelry or gifts. If a girl does not make money, but makes him take her to a restaurant and a movie show and buy her jewelry and then gives him loving, is this different? I would not take a man to my room if I, and love him if I did not want to do that. The others could buy me Saigon tea in the Blossoms bar. The men would water the Blossoms with Saigon tea. I talk with them, and they put their arm around me, and they play the jukebox. But I do not take them to my room unless I would like them to be there. 
Then they would give me money. But I asked for nothing else. Only when they loved me very much, I asked them to get me something. In the place where the GI eats, they have something I cannot get in Saigon. This thing is an apple. I only ask for apples. I buy mangoes and papayas and pineapples and other sweet things to eat in the market. But in South Vietnam, an apple is a special thing. I hold an apple and it fills my hand. And it is very smooth and very hard. And it is red, like my favorite aoyai. So red. I bite it and it is very sweet, like sweet water, like a stream of water from a mountain and it is not stringy like a pineapple, and it is not mushy like a mango or papaya. In New Orleans, I buy many apples. I eat them in America whenever I want to. But is that memory not better? A GI who loves me brings me an apple, and I put it on the table where Mary sits. And after that man is sleeping and the room is dark, I walk across the floor, and I am naked, and the air feels cool on me, and I take that apple, and I go to the window, and I watch the dark roofs of Saigon, and the moon rising, and I eat my apple. In New Orleans, there are apples in stores, and I buy them, and I eat too many. The taste is still good, but it is not special anymore. I'm sometimes very tired. I take off my clothes on the stage of the club. I am not a blossom in New Orleans. I am a voodoo girl. The manager of the club gives me a necklace of bones to wear, and the faces of the men are raised to me, and I am naked. Many eyes see me. Many men want to touch Miss Millay, and I sleep with men in New Orleans. I still do not take them to my bed if I am not ready to like them. When they get up in the morning, I always make sure they shave right. Many of the men miss a place at the back of their jaw or under their bottom lip. I make sure they have a clean shirt. I am ready to wash their shirt if they want me to. But they pay me money and they go. And they do not let me clean their shirt. Sometimes they go before the night is done. These are the men who have wives. I can see the places on their fingers where the sun has tanned around the ring which they took off to come to the bar. Their finger is dark skinned, but the band of flesh is white, and they look naked there, even more naked than I must look to them on the stage. Their ring is in some pocket. I worry about their ring. What if the ring is to fall out of my floor and get kicked under the bed? What do they say to their, to their wife when she sees their naked hand? How does the life change? You meet some man who says he will take you away across the sea and he will marry you. A blossom and even a voodoo girl get many men who talk about love and some of them talk about marriage. You are very careful about that. Many girls on Bourbon Street tell stories and laugh very hard about the men who say they want to marry them. I do not tell the story about the embassy man and the sunburnt duck. They would not understand. I dance naked on the stage, and one night the announcer makes a big deal about Miss Noy being a Vietnam girl. Sometimes he does this. Sometimes Miss Noy is just some voodoo girl. But this night he sees some men in the audience with jackets on and says they were in Vietnam. So he says, I am from Saigon, and I am ready to please. After I dance and put on my clothes and go and sit at the bar, these men in the jackets do not come near me. But one other man comes and stands beside me and he calls me Miss. He says, Miss, may I sit down? If you want to sit next to a bar girl and hope she will think you're an okay man, this is a good way to start with may I sit down. I look at this man and he is a tall man with a long neck so that he seems to stretch up as high as he can to see over a fence. His skin is dark, like he's been in the sun too long. And he's wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans, and his hands are rough. But there is no white man where a ring has been taken off. 
I look at his face and his eyes are black, but very small. His nose is long. Vietnam noses are not long. And though I know many Americans in my life, and some French too, I still lean back just a little when there is a long nose because it seems to be pointing at me. This man is not number one for looking at him. But he calls me Miss. And he stands with his eyes looking down. And then he peeks at me. And then he lowers his eyes again as he waits for me to say if he can sit down. So I say yes. He seems like a nice man. You are very beautiful, Miss Noy, this man says. This is 1981, and Miss Noy is 30 years old, and I am glad to hear some man say it this way. I am not sexy bitch, wiggle the baby, a loyal boy is hot and feels good. These are okay things, too, for Miss Noy. These men give me money, and they love me. But this man says, I'm beautiful. And I say, thank you. You buy me a drink, okay? I say this to all the men who sit next to me in the bar. This is what I'm supposed to do. But I want this man to buy me a drink because he thinks I'm beautiful. So he buys me a drink, and I say, he must buy one too. And he buys a Dr. Pepper, even though it is the same price as a drink of liquor. My drink is supposed to be liquor, but it's mostly water, like Saigon tea. They make it the same in New Orleans, in New Orleans tea. We sip our drinks, and he does not have many words to say. He sits and looks at me and sips, and I have many words I use on them. You from this town? You in New Orleans for long? You like Bourbon Street? You listen to jazz music? What is your work? But I do not use these words. I tell you I'm sometimes very tired. This man's long nose dips down toward his Dr. Pepper like he's going to drink through it, but it stops, and then he lifts his chin a little and sips his straw. His face seems very strange looking, and his hair is black, but a little greasy, and I just let him be quiet if he wants to, and I am quiet too. Then he says, it was nice to see you dance. You come off and see me dance, buy me drinks, okay? You look different, he says. Miss Noy is a Vietnam girl, you never see that before. I seen it, this man says. I was in Vietnam. I had many men say they were in my country, and they always sound a little funny like they have a nasty secret or a sickness that you should be careful not to catch. Sometimes you just call it man. Saying that word with broken glass in their voice or saying it through their noses and their noses wrinkle up like the word smells and it comes out. But this man says the name of my country quiet and I don't understand what American voices do, but he sounds sad to me. I say to him, you didn't like being there, it makes you sad. His face lifts, and he looks at me, and he says, I was very happy there, weren't you? Well, this is something for me to think about. I could just answer the man, who was only one more man who saw me dance naked. I, I could just say yes or no. I could say reasons why. I'm good at bar girl bullshit when I want to talk like that. But this man's eyes look at mine, and I look away, and I sip my drink. What do I know about men, after all? I can't tell anything anymore. I take men to my bed and I save money. And there have been very many men, I guess. It's like eating too many apples. You take a bite now and you can make yourself remember that apples are sweet, but it is, it's like the apple in your mouth is not even there. You eat too many apples and all you can do is remember them. So this man who comes with his strange face and sounds sad when he talks about Vietnam because he was so happy there, I don't know what to make of him. And so I take him to my room, and he is very happy about that. He tells me his name is Fontenot. He lives far away from New Orleans. He owns a little boat, and he works fixing car engines. He was in Saigon one year working on car engines, and he loved that city very much. I ask him why, but he can't really explain. That is all of our talk, every bit of it. Except, before he makes love to me, he says he is sorry he can never get his hands clean. He shows me how the grease from the car engines gets around his fingernails, and he can't get them clean. I tell him not to worry, and he makes love to me. 
And when he gets off me and lies down, he turns his head. And I think that is because he does not want me to see that he is crying. Mm -hmm. I want to ask again if he is very sad, but I don't see anything. His face is away from me, and he wants it like that, and so I say nothing. Those are all the words of that night. In the morning, I go to the bathroom, and he is in the tub, and I kneel beside him and take his hands, and I have a cuticle file, and I clean the grease away. He kisses my hands when he leaves. What do I know about man anymore? That is not so much to say about Mr. Fontenot. He came to see Miss Noy on a Saturday night and left on Sunday morning. Then the next Saturday night I was naked on the stage and I saw his face at the foot of the runway, looking up with his long nose pointed at my special part. And I felt a strange thing. My face got warm and I turned my back to him and danced away. After I finished my dance, I got dressed and came out to the bar, but he was not there. I asked the guy behind the bar, did you see that tall man with the thin neck and the long nose I had a drink with last week? This guy says, the one who looks like a goddamn goose. I don't like this guy from behind the bar. I never even learned his name. So I say, go to hell, you. And I go outside, and there is Mr. Fontenot, waiting on the sidewalk. I go to him, and I take his arm, and we go around the corner and down the block. And he says, I couldn't hang around in there, Miss Noy. It makes me uncomfortable to talk to you in there. I say, I know, honey, I know. I see all types of men, though I realize I don't understand any of them deep down. But I know some men feel nervous at the bar. They come there to meet me, but then they tell themselves that I really don't belong there. It's not worthy of me. And if I take this kind of man to my room, they give me the money quiet, folding the bills and putting them under a vase or somewhere, like it's not really happening. I know that kind of man. They can be very sweet sometimes. We go out to my apartment again. It is a small place, like Sagan. I'm comfortable there. Outside the window is a phony balcony. It looks like a balcony, but it's only a foot wide, just a grill on the window. But it's nice. It looks like lace, though it's made of iron. I close the shade and turn to Mr. Fontenot. He was sitting on my bed. I go and sit next to him. I've been thinking about you, he says. You drive all the way back to New Orleans just to see Miss Noy again. Of course, he says. His voice is gentle, but there's also something in it that says I should know this already. This is plenty strange to me, because I know nothing about Mr. Fontenot, really. A few words. He's a quiet man. I know nothing more about him than, than any man. Then he says, look, and he shows me his hands. I don't understand. I got one of those things you used on me last week. I look closer, and I see that his hands are clean. It just makes me feel one more strange thing, a little sinking inside me. And I say, see, you have no need for Miss Noy anymore. He takes me serious. He puts his arm around my shoulders, and he is right to do this. Don't say that, Miss Noy. So then we make love. When we are finished, he turns his face away from me again. And I reach over and turn it back. There are no tears, but he's looking very serious. I say, Tell me one thing you like in Saigon. Mr. Fontenot wiggles his shoulder and looks away. Everything, he says. Why should I not think you are a crazy man? Everybody knows Americans go to Vietnam and they want to go home quick and forget everything. When they think they like Vietnam while they are there, they come home and they know it was all just a dream. Mr. Fontenot looks at me one more time. I'm not crazy. I like everything there. Everything means the same as nothing. I do not understand that. One thing. Just think about you on a street in Saigon, and you tell me one thing. Okay, he says. And then he says it again, loud. Okay, like I just push him some more, but I say nothing. It is louder, but not angry. He sounds like a little boy. He wrinkles his brow, his little black eyes close. He stays like this too long. I ask, so? I can't think. You are on a street. Just one moment for me, please. Okay, he says, a street. It's hot in Saigon like Louisiana. I like it hot. I walk around. There's lots of people rushing around, all of them prettiest nutria. Prettiest what? Nutria. It's a little animal that has a pretty coat. It's good. Tell me more. 
Okay, he says, here's something. It's hot and I'm sweating. And I'm walking through your markets in the open air. And when I get back to my quarters, my sweat smells like the fruit of the vegetables in your market. I look at Mr. Fontenot, and his eyes are on me, and, I, and he's very serious. I, I do not understand a word he's saying now. But I know he's not saying any bullshit, that's for sure. He sweats and smells like fruit in Saigon. I want to talk to him now, but what am I to say to this? So I just start in about fruit. I tell him the markets have many good fruits, which I like very much. Mangoes, mangoes beans, jackfruit, durians, papaya. I ask him, and he says he has not eaten any of these. I still want to say words to keep this going. <coughs> so I tell him, one fruit we do not have in South Vietnam is apples. I love apples in Saigon when GI bring me apples for the mess hall. I never have apples till the GIs bring them to me. As soon as I say this, Mr. Fontenot's brow wrinkles again, and I feel like there's a little animal, maybe a nutria, trying to claw his way out from inside Miss Noy. I have made this man think about all the GIs that I sleep with in Saigon. He knows now what kind of girl he is talking to. This time I turned my face away from him to hide my tears. Then we stop talking and we sleep. And in the morning he goes, and I do not come and help him bathe because he learns from Miss Noy already how to clean his hands. Is this a sad story or a happy story for Miss Noy? The next Saturday, Mr. Fontenot does not, does not come and see me dance naked. I sit at the bar with my clothes on, and I am upon a time. And I wonder if I'm going to fall off now. Then boom, I go out of that place, and Mr. Fontenot is standing on the sidewalk. He's wearing a suit with a tie. And his neck reaches up high out of his white shirt. And I can bet his hands are clean. And he moves to me. And one of his hands comes out from behind his back. And he gives me an apple. And he says he wants to marry us in way. Once upon a time, there was a duck with a long neck and a long beak, like all ducks, and he lives in a place all alone. And he does not know how to build a nest or preen his own feathers. Because of this, the sun shines down and burns him, makes his feathers turn dark, and makes him very sad. When he lies down to sleep, you think that he is dead, he is so sad and still. Then one day he flies to another part of the land and he finds a little animal with a nice coat. And though that animal is different from him, a nutria, still he lies down beside her. He seems to be all burnt up and dead. But the nutria does not think so. And she licks his feathers and makes him well. Then he takes her with him to live in Thibodeau, Louisiana, where he fixes cars. And she has a nice little house. And she is a housewife with a toaster machine. And they go fishing together in his little boat. And she never eats an apple unless he thinks to give it to her. Though this may not be very often, they taste very good to her. Where will I be to sign books? I'll be up there. Yeah, we have a short intuition and Mr. Bob will stay, read on stage and we will sign books here.
beautiful story about Ms. Noy. Um, how hard is it to, to give voice to a woman? Um, that's a good question. I am, um, good Scent from a Strange Mountain is my seventh book. And um, uh, the six novels that were published from, I started in 1981. Before that, there were five other unpublished novels that will never see the light of day. Why not? Oh, they're, they're just, uh, they were just too, um, they were works that I had to get through in order to start writing well. They're bad, in short. <laughs> Not to put too fine a point on it, uh, they're just dreadful books. Um, but dreadful in an interesting way, that you might want to bring that back up in a moment. I'll answer this question first. Um, the, um, the place that the writer must go to, the artist, is, is that place that, um, uh, some call the artistic unconscious. Um, it's the place that, that we dream from. And you go deeper and deeper into there if you uh, have the courage. And, and, and creating art is a matter of courage. The great Japanese uh, film director Akira Kurosawa once said that to be an artist means never to avert your eyes, never to turn your eyes away. And that's the trick, and it's not easy to do. And even if you do it in one book, to do it again and again, and to make the books you write increasingly difficult and complex, and to challenge yourself to go deeper and deeper into that very frightening place that is your unconscious, that is your dream space. And probably we're also talking about transcendence here, because you as a man have to overcome the fact, in a way, that you are a man. And exactly, but the, what happens is that when you get, the deeper you go into that place, it, the way it felt to me, and we're all, and these are really models, metaphors in a way, of mm -hmm. speaking of that, of that process, which is not exactly any of these things, but it felt as if I finally, with a good scent from a strange mountain, when that can, came to me as a conception, I'd had, strong and rich women characters in my books before, but I had never written in their voices directly. And finally, I had gotten deep enough into that dream place where you suddenly break through to a place where you discover that we are neither male nor female, we are neither American nor Vietnamese, we're neither black or white or whatever, that we are uh, universally human. And, um, and then, if you, can, if you can bring the core of authenticity of the human experience back up and put them into your words, and if you have also um, paid careful attention to the other, I paid careful attention to the Vietnamese and their culture, I paid careful attention to women f for all of my life, but then you can, move, you can bring those universal truths through these, the filter of a female character or a Vietnamese character or whatever, otherness. And you can do it with, with the, the truest kind of authenticity, which is at that place where we are, we are one. Is it also true that um, while you were reading the story, I was thinking perhaps it's even easier to portray a, a, Vietnamese, a Vietnamese woman, to give her the voice, mm -hmm. than an American woman. Is that true? Because she has this so-called simple language. Or mm -hmm. although, although, yes, although in mm -hmm. fact, a, good, a, a fairy tale is the simplest language in the book. Um, I also create characters, in fact, the longest piece in A Good Scent from a Strange Mountain, a, a thing that's essentially a novella length, about 20,000 words, called The American Couple is also in the voice of a woman. And she is a, a much more educated woman, a woman whose command of English is much more subtle. Um, and so there, there was not that to hide behind. Uh, in fact, the challenge is somewhat greater in the simpler language to maintain the subtlety and the profundity of character 
and yet through the simpleness of language. So it's a different artistic challenge, indeed. What I really liked is the fact that um, she knew some lines, you know, like, yes. uh, I can shake it, baby, you know, yes. these, these sort of things. Yes, sir. But then all of a sudden, she speaks in what we call not a standard American or right. not a standard English. You, you mix that without putting it down, because right. it is a tricky business. Oh, it, yes. it could be, you know, a character, caricature. It could, could be, be a caricature, it could be patronizing, it could be stereotyped. How do you do that? Um, you focus for in, in, in several ways, and, and, I, and in, in talking about it, it sounds like a conscious technique, but of course it is not. It's, 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 it's not a thing you think out. The true answer is that you make your own sensibilities, your own inner self become the, the woman. Maybe my early acting training you were helped. Actor. Yes, I was an actor to start. And, um, and, and when I teach creative writing, um, there, you know, there are two schools of acting, essentially. The one which uh, has gained dominance in our century was basically begun by a Russian uh, uh, director named Konstantin Stanislavsky and came out of Moscow, the Moscow Art Theater in the 20s. And it was a reaction to the earlier type of acting. And the earlier acting was uh, a role is created by an actor by careful observation, shrewd and intelligent observation, but observation. You, you looked at models of people and then assumed externally gesture, ex uh, posture, facial expression, intonation or pattern of voice to create this facade, this illusion of the character. Well, when Stanislavski came along and that was the dominant acting style, he, um, he said, no, no, that's not the way art works. That's not the way this art should work. Uh, what the actor must do is to take his own sensual memory, his own sense memory, his own emotional memory, which are rooted in the senses, because all emotions start out as sensual experience. And you bring your own sense memory into correspondence with the imagined sense memory and sensibility of the character you're creating. So you try to connect yourself to the myself subject. to the other, not in a biographical way, mm -hmm. though, you know, but in the but down at the level where all of our emotions break down into responses within our bodies and responses on the outside of our bodies. And most important, one of the more important ways is that as an expression of and as an, as a way of feeling emotions. There's a thing that happens in that, that at any given moment, there are hundreds of sensual cues around us. But we respond to only a very small number at any given moment. How are those chosen? Well, they're chosen by our emotional selves. How, what we pull out of the world around us. What do we notice and what do we not notice? The things that Miss Noin notices about Fontenot things she noticed about her boyfriend, that she spoke to him in the dark night, and that, and that she lit, put her apple next to the Virgin Mary, and that she walked naked across the room and looked at the moonlight. These sense details that are seen chosen within the sensibility of the character utterly define the person. And that's, that's how one does that. You put yourself into the body almost you know, strong figuratively, not mm. quite literally, obviously, but you put mm. yourself, imagine yourself into the body of the character. So when I said in the introduction, uh, when I talked about they whisper, was will das Weib, right. the old question for it, in fact what you do is say, ich bin das Weib. That's exactly yeah? right, that's exactly right. Um, let's see how it works when it comes down to translating, because that is something that really intrigues me. You went to uh, Vietnam, 1971 as a translator uh, and that seems to me an extremely ambivalent position because your job is to 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 understand mm -hmm. the enemy right. their language their culture their, right. their thoughts right. so by understanding them how, how did you feel I mean it seems very hard to to stay within the American army 
Of course. I don't know. But no, I'm no, of course. I mean, it, it, um, the, the, the highest compliments that I've been paid by my Vietnamese readers, and I have been paid this over and over, the Vietnamese people in America have loved this book, and in, and in Vietnam. I've, I've made two trips there. And um, the response to the book has been wonderful. And there is the, the, the most common response is that they were surprised that I was not Vietnamese, or they felt, many of them believing in reincarnation, that I have had a Vietnamese soul. And, and it is that, it is, the, it is the immersion, the relinquishing of self that, that one gives. It is, it is the act of love. I mean, that is what love ultimately is, is the relinquishing of the self to the other. And um, creating and experiencing as a reader a work of art is an act of love making in the sense that you are, you, you leave the self and join the other. And, and it's, it is, and that's the process. And of course, the language made that possible. I could not have done it nearly as well. So didn't create that a, a political dilemma for you. I mean, that, no. that's what I mean. No, no, and don't forget, mm -hmm. um, we did not go to Vietnam. Americans did not go to Vietnam thinking of the Vietnamese as the enemy. In fact, there was an entity oh, as mm -hmm. South Vietnam, yeah. and it was communism was the enemy. That, 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 that was the that was the the justification that was given. Mm -hmm. They did not understand the nature of those people or the war really. But um, so it was. We were there. You know, the, the joining was not simply with the mm -hmm. with the uh, with uh, the enemy. It was with our allies as well. Mr. Sanders, may I ask a question? We have a predecessor here, Mr. Chaim Popper, mm -hmm. and he described to us during his stay that there are three ways to look at a culture, a different culture. Right. One is sitting in your chair, looking over the barriers from yours and looking over the barriers of the other. One is to step out of your own culture, and the third one is to step into the other culture. Right. So, first of all, do you recognize a situation like that? And do you feel that that has had an impact on yourself? Um, in, in his uh, model, because I've not heard him speak of this, when he, when he, the second one, when you step out of the culture, but you, the third one is you step into the other culture, when you step out of your culture in that model, where do you go? What is, you step out to where is the question. Um, I, I would have trouble imagining that option for me personally. Um, I, I stepped out of my culture and into the other. There's no question about that. Not that, but, but in a way, yes and no. It, it, I retained a duality. It is, you, I did not become Vietnamese. I did not affect a, I did not, uh, dress in Vietnamese clothes. I did not wear a, a Mandarin costume. I did not um, s take on uh, the Vietnamese-ness as if it were a new skin. Um, in a way, that's a kind of um, hypocrisy. Um, but I, I came, but, but, it, but I, I, I approached the Vietnamese perhaps as a man would a woman. You, we are one, but we are not one. We, we, we join, and yet, you know, we bring our separateness to each other. It seems to me that, that again, to use the model of lovemaking, even in that, uh, I think it, it is the more appropriate model. I, this is much on my mind, I suppose. <laughs> but um, <laughs> to see the reason why. But, uh, but um, do you understand what I mean? I think it is, it is the relinquishing self to the other and the other relinquishing the self to you. And it's that, it's that exchange. Uh, the Vietnamese um, uh, notion of yin yang, you know, the, the, the precise correspondences of differences. Well, basically, the second one is where you start losing part of your identity ah. you find it when you get into the third one. Right, and right. It's a transitional right? state, yeah. Right, just, just then. The right. right. Let's go back before uh, Vietnam. Um, we discovered, well, I discovered, you knew it already, that you were here in 1967 yes. in Amsterdam. Yes. Um, and I said, indeed, oh, well, then you must have been uh, smoking, and what was it like then, because I was too young to know, and right. all the cliches and stereotypes. And you said, well, 
I don't remember all these things. I just walked around. Um, you didn't go to Paradiso. Uh, you didn't do all the appropriate things. Um, but it also has something to do with the fact that you strongly believe in an individual, individualistic viewpoint, not in, in the, the general Absolutely. experience that is what history is made of. Um, can you describe your, well, position is a strange word, but your, your feelings at that time where you were supposed to be, I right. think, a youngster, a free hippie or a hippie? Yeah, a because I, neither did I belong to the non-hippie. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, um, the interesting thing about that whole rebellion, and most rebellions against established institutions, ultimately render themselves into this almost inevitably because it is part of human nature. Um, the rebellion was against the conformity to the, the, the predominating institutions and, and organizations and political thought of the time. But there was great pressure to conform to that mode of rebellion. And so uh, it was, it, they, they required the joining of this other group. And, it's, and, it, and it required the relinquishing of individualism, uh, but the taking on of simply an opposing uh, conformity. Uh, conformity. And for the artist, that is a terribly uncomfortable position. But you weren't an artist. Well, no, but, but, but I had the temperament yeah. still, of course. I mean, you, the way you see the world. No, I was far from an artist in being able to, to express what it was. That, but but you, don't, you don't become an artist after you, um, after you have learned how to write. You learn how to write because the pressure of the artist's temperament weighs upon mm -hmm. you. And then you struggle against the lumpenness of language all your life trying to find ways to articulate how it is that you sort out the universe. And so um, I think that's a, that, that temperamental attitude toward the world is present in the artist even well before he's, he's ever capable of becoming anything like an artist. This, this is not a criticism, but I, I'm really interested in this. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't there at the moment. Uh, well, I was there, but, but I was too young. Um, there were many people artists who felt inspired by that, well, Provo-like, subculture-like atmosphere. And they, 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 they found their inspiration and, and wrote about it or made music or whatever. You didn't, so, so how's that? Um, <clears throat> you f it, those things that were, came out of that period that really will survive as art um, survived because the artists there saw in the uh, experiences of that movement the individuals and the individual souls that were that were grappling with their own individual struggles and their own individual demons and their own individual yearnings uh, beneath the sameness the works of art that will survive out of that, and it would be interesting to see actually, because I, th I think a work, the test of a work of art is whether it will survive the social and political conditions mm -hmm. under which it was created. You know? That's what art is. The rest is journalism. Mm -hmm. you know? And the, the artist finds his or her way down to the universal truth beneath the surface. It's as if um, when I began writing my books, um, I was often referred to as a, a Vietnam novelist. And, um, and now since I won the Pulitzer Prize, the South has kind of ado adapt adopted me, and I'm a Southern novelist now. I keep, <laughs> keep, keep appearing on panels of what it feels like to be a Southern novelist. And I have the same answer to both, and I think maybe this has some insight into what you're talking about. I am a Vietnam novelist, or someone is a Southern novelist, or someone um, is the novelist of the hippie generation, in the same way that um, I'm, a, well, I'm, a, I'm a Vietnam novelist the same way Monet is a lily pad painter. Mm -hmm. huh? Who would call Monet a lily pad painter? What we have done is identify the artist simply by the, those, the, 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 the venue in which he finds those individual souls to write about. 
for me, Vietnam was the pond that I looked into and saw not lily pads, but the nature, the essence of color and form and light. Vietnam, I did not write about the war. I did not write about the Vietnamese people and culture as such. I wrote about the nature of, the, of, of, of love and kinship and human connection and, and aspiration and nostalgia and memory and the shaping of the individual self and identity. So for that matter, it, it could also have happened in... It could well have happened in the, in the, out, of, out, of the, out of Paradiso, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. could have. Yeah. But, but, but the artist in Paradiso would have had to be perceiving, even while everyone looked the same around them, and while everyone was, was eyes were rolling back into their heads in exactly the same way, they nevertheless could see an individual there who in their own individual soul yearned for something. Because it, this is an interesting thing, I think, Stefan. Um, and it's a thing that astonishes me when I uh, teach creative writing. The essence of the art of fiction. People aspire to be fiction writers and almost every manuscript I ever read from an inexperienced writer fails in understanding or coming to grips with one of the essential qualities of the medium of fiction. We know that fiction is about human beings and it's about human emotion. Very few people would quarrel with those. But there's also an inescapable quality to the art form that we work in that you defy at your own peril or only if the defiance of it is part of your vision. And that is that, that fiction is a temporal art form. It exists in time. Poetry is exempt from this, much of it, most of it, all of it, really, if it wishes to be. Because um, the only viable definition I know of poetry is it's the, it's the art form where the length of the line is part of the form. You know? um, and even those poems that defy the length of the line can all be seen on one page. They are, in a sense, objects. But as soon as you let the line run on and you turn the page, you are, as Miss Noy would say, upon a time. And you cannot deny that as a fiction writer. And, and this is something I learned in the back alleys of Saigon from the Buddhists. You ask any Buddhist, how difficult it is to exist for even 30 seconds of time on the planet Earth. In fact, impossible without desiring something, without wanting something. My favorite word for it is yearning. Fiction is the art form of human yearning. And we find it one soul at a time. But could you see all those souls? Because um, it seems to me that it would be easier to see all those different souls in, let's say, Paradiso or Duluth, because you are not overwhelmed by the exoticism of a new country. Mm -hmm. So that, well, if I just imagine me traveling to Vietnam, well, I'm, I, I don't speak uh, Vietnamese, so it's not a very good example. Let's say to uh, Martinique, I do speak French. Um, I think it will take some time before I see that you know, there are many different sure. people in Martinique. And first of all, I see, oh, they're so, uh, they're, they're really Martiniquean. Uh, you know, right. we start all this, this, this bullshit. It takes some time to see that all these people are different. Mm -hmm. so, so weren't you afraid, um, being there in Vietnam, that you felt into a sort of a exotic trip that you... Sure, although I, you know, I did not choose to go to, it's not no, like no, no, I decided, no, well, I want to be an artist, let me go to learn Vietnamese and go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I, I was there under quite different circumstances. Yeah. And, and so um, I, uh, once there, I was determined to, to open myself to what life is there. Uh, you know, circumstances had brought me there, I thought I would you know, open myself to that. In, and, in, in, and don't let me give you the impression that I was just, um, talking to the trees and the architecture in Amsterdam, you, you know, no, no, I don't, <laughs> but I mean, uh, in, in, um, in uh, Amsterdam as well, though I was not at the Paradiso, I was uh, riding trolleys and I was sitting on park benches and I was sitting in bars and I was talking to people. 
Not that I knew much what to do with that then. I was, you know, I did not understand mm -hmm. even my own gifts at that point, or what it was that was driving me to create. So, uh, you know, I've, I probably did spend too much time just looking at the architecture <laughs> and mooning about watching the, 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 uh, the, the light go buttery against uh, a row house. Um, but, um, but sh you're correct. It would, you know, there should have been, there was opportunity um, to encounter people there, and I did. I did. Just wasn't. It wasn't in a context where everyone. The the difficulty of the Paradiso was that everyone was there, determined to act out an attitude of position, a kind of. There was a kind of choreography, a choreography. Uh, to it, mm -hmm. um, and and so you would have to see beneath that too. But but those who spoke Paradiso could yeah. understand it. Yeah, yeah, it's a very difficult language. Yes, it is. <laughs> Weren't you afraid that you know you were missing out of things? I mean, I think you're terribly right. But mm, I'm just imagining mm. twelve times a novel has been rejected. So you that know something? It was actually yeah? 21. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, it was worse than you said. So, 21. 21 times. You have to have a very strong ego to keep on working and believing in the fact that it's worth it. Yes, that's true. Tell me about your ego. <laughs> um, no, I mean, this no, no, you're right. Yeah. It was, but it was worse when I was writing badly because I had to tell myself that it was good. At least the alleys of Eden was good, and so it was a little easier then. And I knew, I knew I'd make a, I'd made a breakthrough with the alleys of Eden. Um, but um, uh, it was difficult. I mean, it was it was extremely difficult, and 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 very depressing. And ultimately, as a matter of fact, my deepest insight um, was that I was I had to let go of what I suddenly saw was a kind of idolatry in my life. Oh, I had become so determined that, that, that I was I was in fact in pursuit of fame and publication and uh, stature. And I realized that um, uh, this was with with the bad books. I realized that um, I was beginning to shape what I wrote to try to get published. So it was in Paradiso language, yes, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Because Paradiso was was chic. Yeah. Was yeah. was was the thing. And believe me, writing about using Vietnam as a metaphor, using staring into that pond in the late seventies in the United States of America, was was very discouraging for publication mm -hmm. prospects. Those 21 rejections were ecstatic rejection letters, admitting every virtue in the book except its marketability. And, and, or because all the Vietnam novels were, were combat novels, and still almost all the others are, I would even get, and, and the story is, it was a, is about an American deserter living in the back alleys of Saigon. He deserted from the US Army in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And it's now the night that we just celebrated the 20th anniversary. It's the 20th anniversary of that, of the, that novel, too, in, the, in terms of its setting. And this man has lived for four and a half years in a, in a cultural vacuum in the back alleys of Saigon with a bar girl, a former bar girl, who he loves deeply, and she loves him. And the city is falling, and they have to make some serious decisions. And they escape from the city that night. And they go back, and he goes back and forth in his life and tries to sort it out. And then he, the two of them escape together, and they do make it separately out and back to the States, and they rejoin in America. And taken from that cultural vacuum out of the Eden of that back alley, then with the book follows their relationship into its disintegration, uh, where the cultural forces finally crush them. Now, that's the book. And I would get rejection letters saying, there's not enough combat scenes. <laughs> Hmm? But, but I had let go by then, and it was a crucial thing for me. I had let go of the ambition to be published and the ambition that, that I was writing to be published. And an artist does not do that. The artist writes what he sees about the world. Although it's very human to be oh, 
course. I don't, you know, I understand. Of course, cetera, of course. But then you got it all. But then I got it all. Yeah. That was the irony. Once, yeah. I stopped, once I stopped trying to get it, it came to me. Same thing, that once you get published, there are always new levels of frustration. Because I published six novels in the decade of the 1980s. And, uh, and they had gotten wonderful reviews, though were widely ignored. But the reviews, and some very important reviews, loved the books of those six novels. This man right here, Jan van Willigen at De Kern, then at De Kern, um, was the only, the only foreign publication I ever had of any book was The Alleys of Eden, up to, through those six books. My sixth novel, and I was with major publishers, my sixth novel, it's Simon & Schuster, sold 1,083 copies. It got a glorious, better than half page review in the Sunday New York Times book review, which is supposed to make books by Scott Spencer, no less, who did Endless Love, important writer. It went on to get six more reviews and sold 1,000 copies. What happened during that period then mm -hmm. was I, I found myself again needing to do the same thing. I had to let it go. I, to avoid going mad, I, just, I, I did not think about the prizes. I did not think about the sales. I didn't think about the critics. I said, you know, damn it, I'm just going to write what I know about the world. And having finally fully let that go, I, with a book of short stories yet, this is only the sixth book of short stories since 1917 to win the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. It's a book would seem very unlikely. Mm -hmm. Who the hell is Robert Owen Butler? You said, hey, but the book won the Pulitzer Prize. How, how does it work? I mean, the prize? No, well, it's, there is a phone call, <laughs> and I say, um, well, Mr. Butler, uh, good news, I think, something like that. No, you know what happens? The Pulitzer Committee, because there are a number of journalism Pulitzers as well, and they don't know where these people are, so the Pulitzer Committee does not call you. They just do a big press conference in New York, and they put out the names of all the Pulitzer winners, and it goes out on the, on the Associated Press wire, and they let the first enterprising reporter who can figure out your home phone number call you. And <laughs> So, so my call came on Tuesday, April 13th, 1993. You remember the day and the time? At 1.15 in the afternoon. What did you wear? What did you wear? <laughs> Do you remember the trousers? You had Not the trousers, no. I was in mid-sentence on my computer, and I got a phone call from a re uh, reporter from the Washington Post, a man I knew. I'd, re I'd interviewed him with, with him before, the year before. Uh, he found Ali a good, a good sound and, and loved it and did an interview with me. So I knew him, and he was not a, he was a, basically humorless sort, so I, I knew he didn't kid. <laughs> and he called me up and said, Bob, this is David Streifeld from the Washington Post. I want to talk, ask you a couple of questions about your Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> no, I, uh, no I, actually, the first two things I said I, you know, weren't really English. <laughs> um, uh, and that's the way it happened. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see, the Pulitzer takes you utterly by surprise. The other book uh, awards in the States um, issue several weeks beforehand the short list of final nominees. The Pulitzer does not do this. So do you don't even know you're on the short list. But then all of a sudden you, you become famous yeah. and all and get tours and go to Amsterdam. And go to Amsterdam. Et cetera. But I can also imagine that you feel a sort of contempt for all those journalists, perhaps even for me, <laughs> who are now so very interested in you. Whereas, no, well, this is a very well, a human feeling. Didn't yeah, you sure. ever feel like, yeah, now I'm good enough, but I, I have written other no, novels, no, I know. you know? And I I'll, I'll, very selectively. I mean, there's certain reviewers that I kind of, I'd sneered at them at the time, too, but in retrospect, I sneered again. Mm -hmm. But, um, and there were certain, you know, the, the art scene in the United States is very disoriented at times. And, uh, and um, you know, I had, there was a, a national, the National Endowment for the Arts, this is a major grant that's given every year um, to 50 fiction writers. And uh, I had been turned down 11 straight years for that. It's three years with Pulitzer Prize winning stories. And I won the Pulitzer. And a few weeks later, the people from the National Endowment for the Arts called me and asked if I'd like to be on the judges panel. <laughs> 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 I 
Well, in as measured tones as I could, <laughs> I explained to them why that was sort of drastically inappropriate. <laughs> a few months later, that panel that I did not sit on awarded me a National Endowment for the Arts grant. Moral, moral, never ever go into panels because you don't. No, that's right. So um, there was some of that, uh -huh. some of that, but, but not so much. But then you had the prize, but then again, you had to start working. You wrote They Whisper. When, at that particular moment, didn't you feel the, the eyes of the critics at that time? Because now you're famous. Um, I had, it's funny, I, I think I went from uh, one cranky independent state to the other cranky independent state. Before the Pulitzer, nobody was buying the books anyway. Very few people were reviewing them. To hell with them, you know? I write what I want. And fortunately, and I was, I was that's something that would have been even more difficult if my publishers had abandoned me. But good publishers always continued to publish me for some reason. Um, which, is, which, was, which gave me this, at least that much was in my favor. So I, you know, I thought to hell with them. I, I don't care what the critics think about the books. I'm not going to write for them. I'll write for myself. Then I won the Pulitzer Prize. And as somebody said when I won it, he says, well, you know, the, the fourth through the seventh words of your obituary have now been written. <laughs> and, you know, Pulitzer Prize went mm -hmm. So I don't have to do anything more. I don't have to jump through hoops for anybody, you know? I won the Pulitzer. I will now write, as I have always written, exactly the books I want to write. You didn't feel tempted to no. change the way of writing? No, never, no, never, 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 never. The temptations all came before I got published. And several of those bad novels were as a result of, you know, succumbing to those temptations. But I learned my lesson then. Um, you know, I, um, I just, it, it's, it's too important a thing to me. Um, it's, um, it's like, uh, you know, marrying Betsy and then tonight knocking on one of the doors with the red windows, you know? You don't do it. There's no reason to do that. <laughs> one, you know, if you are an artist and you find a way into that place and you create art, you, you, there's no, there's no, you, it is unthinkable to go back to something produced from quite different motives. Just suppose you're working on a new novel right yes, now. Yes, yes. There will be uh, critiques and they will say, like, um, it's so bad, but this man, this Pulitzer Prize winner, who was so promising, uh, promising did things that we don't understand. Well, it already happened. Yeah. With they whisper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know. I didn't um, know that. Yeah. So sure. Um, you can't. You know, good sent from a strange mountain. Short stories, delicate, uh, modulated in tone. And then I write a, a long uh, book which reinvents the structure of of novels in a certain way. Has to reinvent the language of sexuality in a certain way because. Literary writers don't write about sexuality directly. I mean, you, you sit down with any number of your literary friends and play a game. You say, let's think of all the serious literary works of fiction we can about, say, war. And in 20 minutes, you'll have 200 titles on the table. You say, okay, let's think of all the serious literary fiction we can about um, family. Well, it'll take you an hour. Mm -hmm. You'll have 600 titles. All right, now let's name all the serious literary works of fiction we can that are about the essence of human sexuality and intimacy. Not just books with sex in them, mm -hmm. but that really go at that. And you're going to have trouble getting off the fingers of your two hands. Let's, let's give it a try. I would say Bataille is primarily on sex. Mm -hmm. uh, unbearable lightness of being. The sad. Yeah, we're, we're going way back now. How about let's mm. stay within the last 50 okay. years, you know? Um. <laughs> um, well, Mr. Miller. Did Mr. Miller, of course, that's, that's the 30s. Let's, and let's, let's stay within the last 50 years. Now, with the centrality of that subject at our, in, our, in our personal lives and in our culture, just walk around these canals and you'll see, we should, name, we should have a thousand titles. It's, it's, you know. So the point is that, the, that 
They whisper, then, uh, came already under that kind of... And, and it's interesting, because the book is tailor-made for this. A very odd thing about they whisper in the reviews. It, um, a whole new art form sprung up around the book. On the surface, they seem to be 800-word reviews of a book called They Whisper. But in fact, they were these little dramatic monologues with unreliable narrators. Uh, with a subtext that you could read, which is what it was really about, which was the psychosexual makeup of the reviewer. Um, very odd. I mean, for instance, a major terrible review of the book by a man who hated the book in Time magazine. And in the opening paragraph, he's, he said on his own authority that ultimately all sexual positions are ridiculous meaning physical positions. That's his word, ridiculous. Went on to criticize the book over and over for not being funny. He says, what's all this reverence about? He says, That's, that could have been a hilarious scene. This could have been very funny. Now, if you are a man who finds the intimate joining of male and female bodies to be ridiculous and laughable, you're going to have trouble understanding the book. And, <laughs> and, and a lot of that happened. And you add that to... P. Pulitzer envy. <laughs> P. Envy. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. P, P envy. yeah. If you add that, you, you know, you have a mix. Now, we had some wonderful reviews, but we also had a lot of really god awful reviews. Embarrassing for the reviewers, in a way. So I've already gone through that. And, and, and my next book, I, you know, I will not change a word from this point on. And well, the book also sold 45,000 copies in hardback in the United States. You know, so. It's, that's where the Pulitzer gave me that kind of clout. Very good. Um, we Questions from the audience? In fact, end it, but if there are very urgent, interesting, et cetera, et cetera, questions, perhaps, yeah, there's one. Right. Can you hear the question? She, she read They Whisper and wonders about the nature of the trance. And it's a good, I don't know, I haven't used that word tonight, but that's a very good word. I often use that word in connection with the process of creation. It is a trance-like state that you go into, a kind of vivid daydream. And um, um, uh, I don't know how to characterize it, except that with that book particularly, um, I was focused on the moment, th those momentary sensual details in some very vivid way in tracking the, the, um, the subtle linking of those things uh, in the psyche of this man who lives in a kind of landscape, an inner landscape where all the women he's ever loved exist. The thing that made that book possible, interestingly enough, um, uh, we talked earlier about uh, finding finally my way into a place where I could feel comfortable and authentic in writing the voices of women. <clears throat> now, Ira Holloway and I are strictly, uh, exclusively heterosexual. And, um, and yet, to write about the essence of male heterosexuality in its fullest and deepest way, I could not do that until I found the woman's voice in me. And I use that in the book. Ira, uh, as an expression of and a reflection of his intimacy and love for women, um, and seeking the mysteries of their individual and unique personalities, uh, as an expression of that, he, begin, he lapses into the first person voices of the women he loves. So he speaks in their voices in the first person. And, and that's the, that's the, the trance place there uh, involved that, seeking the woman's self, in the, because the ultimate act of lovemaking is to leave the self and to, to take on the other. And it puts a man in a, in a very, especially in a society that, that, um, that defines heterosexuality for men in a very strict and exclusive way, it, um, it, it puts a man in a very vulnerable position to accept that. Uh, but he must, I think, in order f to find the essence of that experience. Somebody else? Yes. 
which, which writers? I'm not sure if I can say um, what the influence is. That would leave that to, to scholars. It's a, it's a, um, I know every, every artist, every writer goes through a period of ravenous reading. And I went through a period of ravenous reading. Um, and the people I read would be familiar to you, I'm sure. Hemingway, Faulkner, uh, James Joyce, before Ulysses. I think James Joyce began to fail as an artist with Ulysses and not just with Finnegan's Wig. Uh, Graham Greene. Um, other books that I, that I felt influenced me but I, or, or you know, moved me, stirred me as a writer that I guess I'm a little reluctant to go back to now and look at very closely. I don't know if they would hold up. Um, Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio, for instance. I guess the most profound act of being influenced by a writer's work, however, is sitting here in the front row. Betsy and I actually fell in love with each other reading each other's books <laughs> before we really ever met. She's a wonderful novelist, and we both were on book tours. Things have happened since he died and break the heart of me. And, um, and it's not a matter of biography. We, we, we fell in love with each other's sensibilities, the way we looked at the world. And then we met in July uh, at a writer's conference where we were both teaching. And within 24 hours, we knew that that was that. <laughs> And it's true what I said about the New York Times and the Sunday. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, this coming Sunday, they, they, the, um, it was a big literary wedding. I mean, Betsy is a very important writer, too, and um, playwright. And so it was, uh, the, the Times recognized it, and they sent a reporter, and they interviewed everybody. There was a lot of literary people at the wedding, and it was at the Tavern on the Green in Central Park. And so there'll be a photo spread and a big story on the wedding this Sunday in the Times. I don't think I've been influenced by literary theory, no. Um, I, I think that um, any external abstract or intellectual belief that a writer takes on and then goes back and tries to make his, his work uh, conform to it or, or reveal it or whatever uh, is working backwards in a way that will will make it impossible ultimately for him to go into that dream place. He's going to go into his head. And oftentimes a writer can, with, particularly with verbal facility, can go into his head and pull beautiful things out and, not, and never realize that he's in entirely the wrong place. My sense of literary theory, as such as it, as it may implicitly seem here tonight, is a retrospective thing. Um, and ultimately, uh, it makes me nervous uh, to speak in these terms, because um, there's a kind of literary theory which Oh, could be. I don't know who the proponents are. Although I would be one. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I have to break it short here because Anna Wartheim is pointing at her watch, and that doesn't mean that she. She, she loves it, but I... No, she says, what a nice watch Anna has, yes. We want to go to babysitters and trains. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> Things come to an end. Um, thank you very much, uh, Robert Butler and Stephen Saunders. I wish uh, uh, the two of you a few more sunny days in, uh, in Amsterdam, and of course, many sunny days in your life. Um, uh, Mr. Butler will speak tomorrow at the Leiden University, and he'll write the Holland's Dagboek, if you read and I say Holland's Blog, read the Holland's Dagboek this week. Um, well, Next lecture will be with uh, Peter Mattison, naturalist author, on the 30th of May. The information is in the hall, and please feel free to stay a while, have another drink, or speak to Mr. Butler. But everybody that has to leave, we can leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect.